Hi, I'm Martin Sweatman, and in this video I'm going to continue my review of the Younger Dryas Impact Debate research. Now so far we've covered the published research from the original Firestone et al paper in 2007 through to the end of 2012 in the last video. In this video I'm going to just I'm going to review just one paper from 2013 in detail, a very important paper for us. Now remember where we got to last time, Although early attempts to reproduce the data in the original Firestone et al. paper cast doubt on the theory, more recent work has shown that some of the evidence is reproducible and problems with those early attempts are likely to be caused by errors with the measurement protocols or interpreting the data. The situation now is that the peak in framboidal iridium rich magnetic grains in the Murray Springs black mat has been confirmed and nano diamonds have been found in the Younger Dryas boundary or black mat in Greenland, Western Europe, and North America. Although the nano diamond evidence from North America has been contested by Dalton et al., that could be another problem with the measurement protocols. Combined, the evidence makes it very likely that a major cosmic impact happened nearly 13,000 years ago. But did it really cause the Younger Dryas mini ice age along with? changes in human cultures and megafaunal extinctions that have been suggested. Now remember the view of Vance Haynes, one of the most experienced archaeologists in this area that we discussed in the first video. His view is that the Younger Dryas black mat represents an instant in time that separates the Clovis world in North America with its plentiful megafauna from the world afterwards, but he nevertheless doubted the impact theory. So his view is based on his extensive understanding of how the evidence relates to the stratigraphy. In other words, he uses the black mat as a reference point. However, opponents of this idea who insist there were no sudden changes in human culture or dramatic megafaunal extinctions and therefore deny the impact theory altogether have a different standard of evidence. As we've seen, they tend to rely on radiocarbon dating evidence rather than stratigraphy. And because radiocarbon dating is so uncertain around this time, this allows them to claim the changes were slow and not at all catastrophic. Okay, so we've got two completely opposing views of the evidence. In one camp, the Younger Dryas boundary is a marker in time and the archaeological evidence is related to it. In the other, radiocarbon dating is of prime importance, despite all its uncertainties. And the Younger Dryas black mat is not viewed with such importance. So who's right? Well, 2013 is a pivotal year for the impact theory because we can finally begin to answer these questions. This year, the most important paper after the original Firestone paper in 2007 is published by Peteyev et al. from Harvard University. They found a new impact marker that is easy to measure, platinum. So here is their main result. It shows a massive spike in platinum in the Greenland ice sheet from the uh, GISP-2 ice core. So along the bottom here, we have the age of that particular ice layers relative to 1950 AD. That's what uh, Cal BP means. And on this axis, we have the platinum. So here's the platinum spike. And this other line here is an oxygen isotope trace. That's essentially a proxy for the temperature. Now, there are many important things about this. It's the key to solving the Younger Dryas impact debate. First, platinum is easy to measure. All you need is a mass spectrometer, which is a very common piece of kit in chemistry labs. And there is no argument or difficulty interpreting result. Either platinum is there or it isn't. Second, Platinum is a very clear marker for a cosmic impact. Iridium was crucial in winning the dinosaur killing impact debate, which is why so far people have been looking for an iridium signal in connection with this Younger Dryas impact. But this result shows why iridium has been hard to locate. It's because the impact was rich in platinum instead. Now there's really no reasonable alternative to the impact theory with this platinum signal. Third, the signal is very strong, it's very clear and isolated, apart from this little pre-peak about 10 years before. So this means that if isolated platinum signals are found in the Younger Dryas black mat, then they can be tied to this one with very high confidence. 
And this has another important consequence. Wherever this platinum signal is found, it can be used as a chronological marker. So it means that we can finally tie together the many different ways of dating sediments. For so long, it's been difficult to relate all the different dating measurements to each other because they're all shifted relative to each other by an unknown amount due to problems in counting ice layers or lake sediment layers or tree rings and so on. Well, now that we have this isolated platinum marker, it acts like an anchor that ties all these different dating methods together. It's really useful. Fourth, and crucially for us, the platinum signal occurs precisely at the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling, so exactly here. So Petaev et al. They defined this, uh, these, these periods. We've got the bolling alarod period and then the Younger Dryas period. So this is their, what they call the transitional period. And this is where the temperature first begins to tumble. And as you can see, the platinum signal is exactly in this, uh, the right place, exactly in the place where it should be. So this is telling us with very high confidence the impact triggered the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age exactly at this time. This very close timing can't be ignored. And there is another consequence of this discovery. Uh, by linking the impact to the climate change, as you see here, it means finding evidence linking the impact with catastrophic consequences is not so crucial. This is because only a major impact, and not a small one, could have caused the dramatic Younger Dryas climate change. And if an impact was large enough to have altered Earth's climate, then it automatically follows that we can expect it to have been severely catastrophic. And even if most of the people and animals that died as a result of this event weren't killed directly by the impact, even if it was the changing climate later that caused some of the extinctions, well, it's very likely the impact event was responsible for that too. So whichever way you look at it, it's the impact that triggered uh, these events. And this is all that Firestone and uh, et al. were saying back in their 2007 paper. Okay, so the stakes have been raised with this paper. The only avenue left uh, for doubters of the impact theory is to show that this platinum signal resulted from a small impact, uh, a small impact and therefore was non-catastrophic. But this is highly unlikely to be the case because of this very good coincident timing with the climate change. Now, although this discovery is potentially huge, there are some problems with this paper. First, uh, see the ammonium spike uh, that's illustrated here. Now, Ammonium is associated with a massive burning event. So ammonium ions are generated by wildfires, for example. But the timing of this ammonium spike looks to be very off. It's about 30 years too late compared to the impact signal, compared to the platinum signal, uh, which is odd. Uh, you'd expect them to coincide if the impact theory is correct. And just to be clear, all this data is from the same uh, GISP2 ice core in Greenland. So we don't need to worry about converting chronologies or time scales from one kind of measurement to another. So these signals should be consistent if the impact theory is correct. So the fact that these signals don't coincide casts some doubt on the Younger Dryas impact theory. The other problem with this paper occurs when Pete Evertel try to understand what kind of impactor it was. Now, most of our knowledge of cosmic impacts involves hard asteroidal meteorites, so it's understandable that Pateyev interpreted uh, this as some kind of hard asteroidal body, body, either mainly rock or iron. Now, they plump for a particular kind of large iron meteorite, perhaps as much as uh, 0.8 kilometers in diameter, they say. However, the Comet Research Group's favored scenario is a fragmented comet. Uh, but Pete et don't, al. don't consider this at all. They don't even mention it. Now, there's a good reason to favour the comet scenario. It's because a hard asteroidal body made of iron or rock probably wouldn't produce all the evidence seen across several continents. The damage from a single body of the size suggested would probably be more local. A highly fragmented impactor is favoured by the impact theory to have produced all of the geochemical signals that we've seen across such a wide uh, continental scale area. Now, Pete Evertel do mention the possibility 
of a highly fragmented iron rich asteroid. But the problem with that view is that those objects just don't exist. Only comets are highly fragmented. Yes, uh, asteroids have been observed to travel in gravitationally bound pairs, but they are very rare and still not fragmented enough to have generated the extensive impact signals we see across continents. So it really has to be a comet. And by ignoring this, Pete et et al are kind of painting themselves into an untenable corner. The fragmented comet scenario is much more likely because we know that comets orbiting within the inner solar system typically decay via a hierarchy of fragmentation events producing the meteor streams that we see on Earth. So, for example, uh, we have observed directly the fragmentation of Swashman Wackman 73P into many smaller fragments. So, this is just what comets do naturally in the inner solar system. Nevertheless, even with these caveats, this platinum signal is still a major discovery. So what is the response to this platinum paper in the research literature? Well, there's only one critical comment uh, from Mark Boslow. He's a computational high energy impact specialist. Now, Boslow is aware of the Comet Research Group's favored scenario of a fragmented comet because he commented on it after the paper by uh, Israel Alcantara et al, from the previous year, 2012. So this is the Mexico paper. Now we didn't go through that last time because remember we rejected the time depth model for the sediments that they looked at in that paper. Nevertheless, the fragmented comet impact scenario defined in that paper is perfectly reasonable. And Boslow is very aware of it because he commented on it. So what does he say about this new platinum discovery? Well, it seems essentially that he is saying that the platinum signal couldn't have been caused by a fragmented iron asteroid because they don't exist, which is quite right. And it couldn't have been made by any kind of highly fragmented impactor at all, because the platinum signal is unconnected to the ammonium signal. And therefore, all the geochemical evidence that supports a catastrophic impact. And because there is no obvious impact crater, it couldn't have been a large iron asteroid either, he says. So the only option left in his view is a small iron meteorite. And with this argument, he's essentially dismissing the correlation in the timing of the platinum peak and the climate change. He's, a dis he's dismissing it as being a coincidence. But this is unwise. The timing is spectacularly good. Now, in their counter response paper, Petayev et al. add an additional piece of evidence into the mix uh, that, that is very useful to know, something they didn't mention in, in their first paper. They argue that the width of the platinum signal is important. In their view, Boslow's small iron rich impactor wouldn't produce such a broad peak. The breadth of this peak is proof, they say, that debris was suspended or injected into the atmosphere for a period of over 20 years, which also explains why it was a large catastrophic climate altering event. A small iron rich impactor can't explain this observation. So they reassert their view of a highly fragmented, iron-rich impactor. But we know these simply don't exist. So we are left in limbo. Neither party, Pete et al. or Bodlo, has a convincing explanation for all the evidence. None of their scenarios are at all likely. It turns out the key to resolving this impasse is realising that the ammonium spike shown here by Pete et al. occurring 30 years after the platinum signal is in the wrong place. In fact, the ammonium signal has been completely misrepresented by Pete Evatel. You have to go back to the original 1993 paper by Majewski et al uh, to see what has gone wrong. And presumably neither Pete Evatel nor Boslow did this, uh, but I have. So here is the 1993 paper by Majewski where this ammonium signal in the GISP2 ice core is actually measured. Now in their text later on, they say that the ammonium signal begins around 12859 BP and ends around uh, 70 or 80 years later. And by the way, BP means before 1950 AD. So already the ammonium spike in the platinum paper by Petayev has been misrepresented. It should be a broad hump, not a narrow spike. 
But worse than that, the date quoted for the onset of the ammonium signal here, 12859 BP, is wrong. It's a typographical error. If we look at their plot, we see a different story. This is the ammonium spike here. Actually, their plot shows the ammonium signal begins around 12,900 BP, which agrees perfectly with the platinum signal in the PETA paper. Now, the easiest way to see this is to put the platinum and ammonium plots from these two different papers next to each other and compare them directly, uh, which is what I've done here. Now, we have to stretch the scales a lot to get them to line up, but once we've done that, it's a very clear the timing of the ammonium and platinum signals could hardly be any closer. So here's the ammonium signal from the Majewski paper in 1993. And I've had to stretch the scale for this one to, make, to, to enable it to line up. And here's the platinum signal from the Petaev paper, 2013. And I've had to condense, squash the scale to get that to line up. But you can see that these scales do now in fact line up. So we've got 13,000 BP here, 12,900 here, 12,800 here. And as you can see, when we project this platinum signal down onto the ammonium plot, the timing of the ammonium spike and the platinum signal is perfect. So what has actually happened here is that Majewski et al in 1993 simply made a typo in their text and gave the wrong date at the start of this ammonium signal. Probably in their text they should have written uh, 12,899 and not 12,859 BP, a difference of 40 years. And this typo has been perpetuated by Pete et al and then by Boslo, and nobody thought to check the raw data. Now it's not just me saying this, the Comet Research Group joined by Majewski also corrected this problem in a paper in 2018, so that's last year. But of course, until this happened, it meant that we had five more years of argument about this misalignment, and all because of a typo. And we won't get to that 2018 paper where the correction is made in these review, in these review videos uh, for a while yet. So at the end of the day, the ammonium signal, which signals extensive wildfires, and the platinum signal, which indicates a cosmic impact, both occur precisely at the onset of the Younger Dryas climate change. Now this makes perfect sense. It's almost certain the impact was catastrophic and it caused the climate change in extensive wildfires. And the most likely cause of all this evidence then is a massive fragmented impactor. And this means a fragmented comet, not an asteroid, just as the Comet Research Group have been saying. So after this paper, the search was on for platinum. If an abundance of platinum is found together with the other impactors, like the nano diamonds, across a wide range of younger Dryas age black mat sites, then it virtually proves the comet impact theory. It will mean the job of the comet research group is finally done. Until that's achieved, it could still be argued at a stretch that the Greenland impact was a small iron rich meteorite and the correlation with the climate change and wildfires is a coincidence. But all the other geochemical evidence is also against this option. So it really does look to be an almost impossible situation for deniers of the impact theory. Okay, if you like that, then stay tuned for the next video, which will follow in a couple of weeks, uh, and take a look at my blog, martinswetman.blogspot.com, and my book, Prehistory Decoded, now in the next video, I'll look at all the other papers published in 2013.